Uh, one of the great strengths of the Northeast Corridor uh, is that uh, it connects to or is connected by uh, five very important uh, feeder corridors uh, starting in the north, uh, the Downeaster, uh, to Portland and Brunswick, uh, the, nor uh, the New Haven, Hartford, Springfield, and Knowledge Corridors uh, connecting New Haven all the way up to uh, Montreal, uh, the Great Empire Corridor from New York to Albany to Buffalo, Keystone from Philadelphia to Harrisburg and ultimately to Pittsburgh, uh, and the Southeast Corridor that heads south from Washington uh, eventually all the way to Atlanta. Uh, it, is a very, it creates a very unique and very powerful uh, interconnected uh, rail program uh, and is, I think, one reason the Northeast Corridor is as successful uh, as it is and certainly as successful as it will be. Uh, as everyone seems to be saying today, the, the, um, <clears throat> the model is changing. We can't rely entirely on federal and state funding uh, for these programs and Mr. Dove has been looking uh, quite a bit at the Northeast Corridor and options um, for advancing Al -Al that. Al is what's known in this business as an alternative asset manager. We manage a massive $150 billion of capital for institutions, pension funds, uh, high net worth individuals, uh, endowments, insurance companies, and other man money management groups. And they are looking for good long-term investments with superior returns and they entrust that money to the Carlisle Group, and we're one of uh, maybe four leading houses this, in this area. And what I'm trying to tell you is how I would look at this project as someone that might want to invest my investors' money, these insurance companies' pension funds, and the sorts of things which I find either attractive or disturbing. My, my personal view or my Carlisle's view on the, on the possibility of investment in the Northeast Corridor. So we start with looking at where all the rail tracks are and where all the people are, and clearly you can identify, in our mind, four uh, areas. The West Coast, Texas, Chicago, and the Northeast Corridor. And that's the one where we think is the most obvious and the most um, likely to receive capital from the private sector in the short term. Um, why? because clearly there is population density in the Northeast Corridor, and you hear all the day about this rich 1% that uh, controls all the wealth. Well, a lot of them, as the Occupy Wall Street people will tell you, actually live on this map somewhere in the Northeast Corridor. So it is a very attractive area. This is, uh, gives you the same point from a different angle. If you can see the different um, metropolitan areas, four of the largest metropolitan areas are in the Northeast uh, Corridor. And um, this all makes for a very strong case from a macro perspective of why uh, a finance person would be interested in a, in a project in the Northeast Corridor. The other reason, of course, is congestion. Um, this graph illustrates quite vividly the, the air congestion in the Northeast Corridor. As someone that flies regularly up and down, I can tell you that I look at the weather and I decide whether I'm going to jump on the Excella or whether I'm going to go on the plane. So we have major constraints at airports. Uh, we have big delays of on-time arrivals um, at the three major airports. And of course, we have roads which are clogged every day. And the I-95 corridor is a very um, drastic and stark reminder of that uh, situation. So my travel options to come from DC to New York today were clearly three. One, I could fly. Uh, fortunately, Carlisle is generous enough to pay for my ticket, so the cost is we're at somewhere between $150 and $300. We have a, a, a corporate rate with Delta, so we benefit from that. And, you know, the three hours, that's a good day, but three hours is in theory. I could go by train, slightly cheaper, but surprisingly not that much cheaper. I mean, you go on the Excella, you are paying, and it's full. And that, again, is two hours, 45 minutes, so we round that up to, to uh, three hours. Or finally, I could have driven, clearly the cheapest. Um, I would be here by now, but it would have been a little bit more stressful than the first two, uh, particularly more stressful than rail. So some of these bridges are very, very old, and I'm sure they're well maintained up to all the standards, but, but to run 200 plus mile an hour trains, which is what should be done, uh, is a tremendous amount of, uh, of capital expenditures which are going to be needed. Uh, and this is what makes the Northeast uh, attractive to a financial investor. There is tremendous opportunity for upside. Again, 
facts that you know as well as I do. Where are the bottlenecks on the, on the northeast corridor? Well, I don't pass one there. So today, um, the Excella trains, we, as I understand it, are 300 passengers. I mean, compare that to Japan, where there's 1,300 passengers. Compare the headways, and I realize that the Excella is sharing the tracks, which is one of my big issues here. To build high-speed rail, it has to be on a dedicated track. Um, you have 60-minute headways, whereas in Japan you have 5 to 10-minute headways. Again, there's tremendous opportunities from a financial perspective as an investor looking at this to see how we could really make some improvements and, uh, and build uh, a better system. Say that if you were able to build a true high-speed rail network in the Northeast Corridor, your shift from road and from air into the, ra the rail system would be very dramatic. And these, these statistics seem to estimate that around 50% up from 28% uh, would be the share of rail in the, in the Northeast Corridor. This is all very good. There's a lot of good macro data here. There's a lot of good reasons why I, as an investor, should actually put some money into a project. However, any time you look at a project, there is risk and you have to think about it. And the number one risk here is all of these political ob uh, obstacles. Uh, I have eight states seven operating rail services, and I might be wrong here. I have my friends in the federal government, and I have countless commuters, all of whom are going to be asking questions about whether this is the right thing to do. Yeah. Is to be a good high-speed rail, which really works efficiently, uh, you need a couple of things. One, you need to have a dedicated track. So if you're doing a dedicated track, these numbers which uh, my um, research people came up with, say somewhere between 90 and $120 billion. That's a lot of money. Uh, without the new tracks and just upgrading, then you're talking 15 to 50 billion. So um, you ask, where are you going to get this money? There is a lot of money out there through institutions like Carlisle that are looking to make investments in infrastructure. And I think that it, it, getting some money will not be a problem if some of these other issues can be uh, addressed. But two examples of rail projects which have been financed uh, by the private sector. One the, at the top is from my own country in the UK, the High Speed One line, which if you've uh, ever been to Europe, you'll know is the direct line between St Pancras in London and the Gare du Nord in Paris. Uh, this is the way that business travelers, uh, that um, tourists uh, and lots of other people just travel between London and Paris. The, air corridor between London and Paris has diminished extensively and the only reason that people fly out of London to Paris is because they're connecting in from Washington or from New York or from Detroit or from, where, from wherever. But what's important here to understand is that that uh, project in the UK was built by the private sector with full government support. So the, the UK government outsourced uh, to a number of different engineering firms, including back to where I, where I worked, a, a date certain, cost reimbursed, but with caps, contract to engineering uh, construction companies, who then went and built a dedicated track. After it was built and the trains were running, the government then turned to the private sector and sold that track for $2.1 billion, which is 15 times the amount of earnings that the track was earning every year under a 30-year concession and thus recouped 30% of the cost. That, ladies and gentlemen, I would suggest is the model for the Northeast Corridor. Uh, if you can have the thing built by the private sector and show it can run, I am confident that you will find people like me uh, very, very willing to uh, actually come in and buy it. So some recommendations. First of all, sort out these political jurisdictions. I can't deal, or the private sector can't deal, with eight different uh, state governments and, and uh, different rail authorities. Create some sort of high-speed rail authority in the Northeast Corridor. Number two, uh, the federal government's chief function is to provide a portion of the funding and to streamline the process. They've got to be able to help fund it initially get the engineering construction companies to bid against each other to build the line. They've got to provide the rights of way. Again, I am a big proponent on having a dedicated uh, line because that's the way it really should work. It's the way it works in other countries and not an upgrade of the existing line. Number three, once established, uh, turn to the private sector, as I said, to do the building and, uh, and, and keep, the, 
keep the project on track through holding the private sector's feet to the fire on the, constru uh, on the construction of the project. And I would also suggest that you build the project in phases, consider DC to New York, or maybe even just Philadelphia to New York. You know, the private sector would be quite happy to buy into the Philadelphia to New York section, which would give you the capital to continue to the end.